Welcome everybody. Today I would like to talk about like this paper of Ben Bernanke, like the former president of the Federal Reserve. Uh, it's uh, about the Taylor Rule, a benchmark for monetary policy, like the paper is published in 2015. And here, like you can see a picture of Ben Bernanke. So like it seems to be the case that in 2015, uh, it is still the case that the Taylor rule is relevant. And uh, yeah, B uh, Bernanke writes about this topic. So uh, let's have a look at this paper. And in a first step, let's ask the question, why is like the Taylor rule, which was invented in 1993, uh, why is it still relevant today? Um, Williams, he argues that this is uh, due to the so-called Federal Reserve Accountability and Transparency Act of 2014, like FRED. And since um, this um, suggestion of uh, like an act, it is the case that monetary policy rules have gained importance in the last few years. So like um, the big question is, whether like the central banks should be accountable like for their monetary policy and therefore it is uh, very important to have a benchmark and then we can benchmark the actual policy of the central bank against uh, this uh, Taylor rule or like the Taylor rate in the end. Um, yeah, like we said, the Taylor rule is a simple equation, a rule of thumb intended to describe the interest rate decisions of the Fed and uh, is a valuable descriptive device. And Bernanke argues that only recently John Taylor began to argue that his rule should also prescribe as well as describe the interest rate decisions of the central bank, of the Federal Reserve and should be a benchmark for monetary policy. Let's refresh our knowledge with respect to the basic Taylor rule. Uh, like on the left-hand side, we have the Taylor rate, like a short-term nominal interest rate, which like should uh, be equal to the federal funds rate. Then P symbolizes the inflation rate, 0.5 and 0.5 are weights. Uh, y minus Y star, that's the difference between actual, so realized GDP, and potential GDP. Potential GDP is determined according to, like the long-term growth trend of the past. Uh, P minus two, that's the difference between the realized inflation rate P and the inflation target, and the inflation target is assumed to be equal to like 2%. Sometimes we say that this term P minus uh, two, uh, that's the inflation gap. And then the last element in this equation, like the plus two, that's like the real interest rate estimated over like a long-term period in the past. Um, Bernanke argues in his papers that originally Taylor did not seem to believe that the rule should be more than a general guideline. In his original paper, like Taylor took pains to point out that a simple mechanical rule could not take into account the many factors that policymakers must consider in practice. Afterwards, like Ben Bernanke, he re-estimates um, the Taylor rule, uh, rate and he's using the original Taylor rule. So he's using the same weights as Taylor. Uh, he's also using a GDP deflator for measuring the inflation gap, but uh, he's using the uh, a special form of the output gap. So the output gap is based on real-time data. So um, in the first step, I think it makes sense to clarify this term like real-time data. Uh, Real-time data, data, this is data that were known to policymakers at the time they made their decisions. So for the time period 1993 to 2009, 
Bernanke is using estimates prepared by the Federal Reserve staff for the meetings of the board. Uh, this uh, information is only disclosed after a five-year time lag. Therefore, for the time period 2015 to 2000, uh, 2010 to 2015, uh, this information is not available at all. And therefore, Bernanke is using con Congressional Budget Office um, interest rates uh, because like the information from the Fed staff meetings are not publicly available. So this already points uh, to a problem here that the public does not have uh, the same information set as the Federal Reserve and therefore it is problematic um, whether the public can make like the Fed Reserve accountable because the information set is completely different. Uh, I'll come back to the real-time data issue later on. But now let's have a look at the uh, figure one. So this is the original Taylor rule from uh, 1993 to 2015. And more or less, uh, we can say here that um, the green line like the Taylor rule is only like in the negative range for like a few quarters and furthermore like after 2011 the uh, Taylor rate is like much higher than the actual Fed's fund right and therefore uh, the question is whether the uh, Federal Reserve like should increase uh, the Fed funds rate like after 2011. So when we believe in the original Taylor rule, then uh, the monetary policy in 2015 is to lose. Like uh, the Taylor rate is at 2%, the actual Fed fund rates is at 0%. Um, Bernanke, he argues that we should use like a modified Taylor rule. And he's not using a GDP deflator because this is definitely not the target of the Federal Reserve. So he's using a core personal consumption expenditure index, PCE, which excludes like volatile food and energy prices. However, some sensitivity analyzes show that the choice of the inflation measure, measure does not influence the final outcome of the Taylor rate too much. Um, like, of course, a consumer price index uh, can differ from GDP deflator inflation because like some goods are not produced for consumers, such as investment goods or goods for government spending, like some guns, which are like used by the police or military. This is not private consumption and does not affect the consumer price index. But when these weapons are created in the US, it affects uh, GDP, the GDP deflator inflation. Some goods are produced in the US and are exported, and some consumption goods are imported, for example, from China. So uh, let's sum up. Uh, Bernanke is using um, um, consumer price index instead of the GDP deflator, but um, uh, this is only a minor change. This does not affect the result too much. Uh, but what affects the result is that uh, Bernanke opts for a different weight for the output gap. So like Bernanke says, like we have to use a 1 instead of 0.5. Let's go back to the Taylor rule and uh, check where we have to make an adjustment. So Bernanke is adjusting this 0.5 here. He argues that 0.5 is not the right value. We should take the value of 1 uh, instead of 0.5. Uh, let's have a look how the new uh, Taylor rule and Taylor rate looks like. So the green line, this is like the new Taylor rule or like the Taylor rate. 
which um, stems from the modified Taylor rule. It is the case that here um, the federal funds rate like uh, follows uh, the modified Taylor rule closely. Uh, but then it is the case that here uh, the Taylor rate becomes clearly negative for a very long time period. And also only recently it is the case that the Taylor rate becomes positive again. So during the crisis from 2009 to 2014, like the Taylor rate was quite negative and only in 2015, the Taylor rate started to become positive again. So it seems to be right what the Federal Reserve did. So keep the Federal Funds rate close to zero, about as low as it can go, while looking for other tools, other instruments, for example, like to purchase securities to achieve further monetary ease, to implement an even more expansionary monetary policy. So like um, ben, ben, ben Bernanke, he's like defending the interest rate decisions of the Fed. So he argues that the Fed did not make any decision, uh, any mistakes while like uh, Taylor um, argues in the direction that um, the monetary policy of the Federal Reserve is too loose. So Ben Bernanke argues that monetary, monetary policy should be systematic, but not automatic. So the simplicity of the Taylor rule disguises the complexity of the underlying judgments that the Federal Reserve Board members must make. Uh, the Taylor Rule assumes that policymakers know and can agree on the size of the output gap. Um, we can also argue like what is the size of the equilibrium federal funds rate? For example, Taylor assumed a real rate of 2% and hence a nominal rate of 4%. What if the real interest rate like decreased over time? Then of course also the equilibrium nominal interest rate uh, has to change, has to be lower than 4%. So nowadays um, uh, it seems to be unjustified to use a real rate of 2% because the real interest rate slowed down and is uh, on a lower level today than it was in 1993. Uh, the Taylor rule uh, has no guidance when the Taylor rate is negative, then um, because the focus of the Taylor rule is on the interest rate, uh, we cannot use uh, the Taylor rule anymore, but we have to find other measures in order to implement an even more loose monetary policy. What are the optimal sizes of the weights? Uh, the weights change according to changes in the preferences and also by the structure of the economy, um, especially when the channels of monetary transmission change, then also this will have an impact like on the weights. I said already that I would like to talk about real-time data in the end. Uh, this is like uh, stems from Wikipedia. And uh, one macroeconomist like Orphanidis, like he plays an important role in this discussion. So real-time economic data and other official statistics are often based on preliminary estimates and therefore are frequently adjusted as uh, better estimates become available. These later adjusted data are called revised data uh, the terms real-time economic data and real-time economic analysis were coined by the two economists like Diebold and Rudebusch. The macroeconomic, macroeconomist Rudebusch defined real-time analysis as a use of sequential information sets that were actually available as history unfolded. And Orphanidis, he has argued that economic policy rules may have very different effects 
when they are based on error-prone real-time data, uh, then they would if policymakers followed the same rules but had more accurate data available. So let's have a look at how real-time data looks like. So here we are looking at uh, GDP uh, of Australia. Uh, that's of course quarterly data. And for example, uh, when it comes to uh, the uh, real GDP in the first quarter of 2014, uh, we have here some information like about two and a half years later, but they change uh, afterwards. So even uh, from February uh, 2017 to March 2017, like these numbers are updated and all this information, they should like resemble and represent the real GDP uh, in uh, the first quarter of 2014. Only like after March 2017, then this figure like becomes constant. No, it's not the case. Like here, even from May, <coughs> sorry, from May 2017 to June 2017, like the figure is revised again. So of course, like uh, it, uh, the, the, the Taylor rate will be different when we use this information instead of that information. So we have to check what kind of information was available to the policymaker uh, at that point in time when the de decision uh, with respect to the interest rate was made. Here we have another extreme case. For example, we are looking at the balance of payment data of France. And when you look at the second quarter of 2015, it is the case that in September 2016, um, this number was um, the best estimate uh, for uh, the GDP, for the bal um, balance of payment uh, for the current account balance. Sorry, like I'm talking about the current account balance here of France. Um, it was uh, this number, and one month later, like the figure looks completely different. So, like there is a big revision made um, uh, that about like one and a half years later. So also here, like real-time data um, are important. Like we should use that kind of information which is available to the policymaker when uh, the policymaker made the decision. Then like one question with respect to the size of the output gap, uh, we have here like the real GDP of Denmark. And when we estimate a growth trend over the time period from 2000 like to 2008, then the red line is a growth trend and like there would be a very big output gap in 2015. But it's questionable whether we can just use the growth trend from 2000 to 2008 in order to uh, um, uh, forecast the growth trend in the upcoming years. It seems to be the case that there was something going on in 2008 to 2009, and maybe it is a case that now a real GDP is on a completely different level. But as you can see, like also the growth trend uh, seems to have changed. The growth trend is lower now, so like the GDP growth is slowing down. And hence, it is very um, unclear whether we should use like the red growth trend, whether we should use the green growth trend, or whether we should use like an average. Like what kind of information uh, should we use in order to um, in order to measure like the long-term growth trend, and of course. This has a big impact on the output gap. Uh, this is the end of my lecture. Thank you so much. Have a nice day.
Bye-bye.